Well, good morning, Wednesday morning, and we are together now looking at 1 Samuel chapters 13 through 15. Uh, I know that it says we're looking at chapters 14 and 15, but you'll remember that last week we only looked at chapter 12. And that's because this section 13 through 15 all kind of answers one question and leads up to a massive shift in the book of 1 Samuel, because we're about to move from the kingship of Saul to the anointing of his successor. Uh, That's a story for next week. But through 13 and 15, it answers the question as to why does God reject Saul? And the simplest answer to that is because Saul rejected God. Um, You you see this specifically in these chapters when Saul rejects God's word that's delivered from the prophet Samuel to Saul. So that right before Saul is going to go into battle against the Philistines, uh, he doesn't wait for Samuel the prophet as he was instructed to wait for the word of God. Instead, Saul disobeys. And he goes about offering a sacrifice by himself. Uh, Now, because of that, the fact that he refuses to listen to God, Samuel, when he does come, says that he now has forfeited the hope of having an eternal destiny, a dynasty. It's going to end with him and the kingship will be passed on to another. His son, Jonathan, will not sit on the throne after him because someone after God's own heart will And that's a real shame because when you see the events that take place in these chapters that concern Jonathan, you realize that Jonathan would have been a far superior king than Saul has been or would be. When Jonathan is outnumbered and outarmored, he bravely goes into battle, trusting that God can do anything, even with meager provisions. He trusts God to do the impossible and he discovers that God comes through. At the same time that Jonathan is listening to God, Saul has actually replaced God's prophet with a a, a false prophet. Um, He's actually the wicked son of the unfaithful priest Eli, uh, who's the uncle to Ichabod, whose name literally meant God's glory has departed. He sided with the, the very wrong group of people, listening to the wrong voices and failing to listen to God. Um, and, And Yet, throughout that time, Jonathan's faith in God is uh, so strong uh, that he launches into a two-man battle and brings about an incredible victory. Uh, Instead, Saul actually rushes into a battle. He enforces a fast among his soldiers, uh, even without even consulting his false priest that he's set up. And because of his godless leadership, It means that Israel goes into battle starving. And when his army does get finally to eat, they eat meat with blood in it and they end up sinning before God because of, well, because of Saul's impetuous godless leadership. Even more tragically, though, is that when Saul finally tries to pray, God refuses to answer. Instead of recognizing his own sin, Saul actually blames then Jonathan for God's silence and tries to kill his own son. See, all of these problems just keep mounting up around Saul, so much so that when he takes the battle to the Amalekites, he once again does not listen to God's command and he keeps the best of his plunder for himself instead of giving it all over to destruction. And when Saul is confronted by Samuel, he pretends that his motives were honourable. I did obey. But Samuel says to Saul that he's missed the point. It wasn't about the outward appearance of things. It was about genuine obedience. And so famously in verse 22 of chapter 15, he says, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams. And I think it'd be good for us to reflect on this. It's talking about the position of our heart towards God versus the outward show. The the genuine faith versus all the talk, the resting in Jesus or the going in our own strength. It's about obeying God's loving commands versus doing what seems right in our own eyes, which is what is characterizing Saul through these chapters. And Saul's consistent failure to obey means that his kingdom will be ripped from his hands and it's going to be given to someone more worthy. And we'll see who that is next week. God's rejection of Saul comes because of Saul's rejection of God and his word. See, Saul's story is supposed to make us desperate for a king who both shares God's heart and listens to God's voice. And we know who that king 
ultimately and perfectly is. And when you think about how different Jesus is as the true king compared to Saul, you see such vast contrast. Jesus obeyed God's word and fulfilled every command. His heart and God's heart were the same, in sync. Jesus did nothing without prayerfully waiting for God's direction. And like the good leader that Jesus is, he took responsibility for sins, the sins he didn't even commit. In fact, he committed no sin and yet became sin for us, whereas Saul shirks responsibility and points to others. But think about that. Saul rejects God's word, but Jesus was God's word perfectly lived. And now we see the one whose eternal dynasty has been established because of who Jesus is as God's rightful king. So th these chapters tell us, well, don't be like Saul, looking to the external appearances, being all about show and nothing about genuine obedience and trust in God's word. And what happened to him? He lost the kingdom. And these chapters are a reminder to us to accept God's word and to see that both his commands and his word meet perfectly in Jesus. And when we accept Jesus as king, we gain a kingdom that lasts forever. And it calls for us to think about what our trust and our obedience looks like to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you tell us that you delight in loving obedience, in faithful trust. And Lord, we see that in these chapters in the reverse. One who fails to heed your word, who goes it alone, who thinks that they are in control and when confronted with their sins, shirks responsibility. Heavenly Father, we come before you recognising our sin and our need for a king who is your word and the one who perfectly lives out true obedience. Heavenly Father, help us today to trust ourselves to Jesus and help us also, Lord, to walk in a way of obedience before you. We pray, Lord, that you would seek to expose in us any disobedient, offensive way and lead us in the way that is everlasting, trusting in that everlasting kingdom, the dynasty of your son, King Jesus, in whom we place our trust. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.